the best player in college basketball. I mean, I'd like to see who's better right now. I mean, this guy can do it all. I know that we believe in Adam Morrison. He is a big-time player of the year candidate. What do you think, guys? Do you believe? Led the nation in scoring as a junior. A gym rat. My agent says there's some interest uh, around the league because, you know, I don't really play much here. And uh, so we'll, we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens. Who knows? Born July 19th, 1984, Adam Morrison was bound for basketball from the start. It ran in the blood. His dad was a coach, and Adam got a job as Gonzaga's ball boy shortly after moving to Spokane, Washington. As incredible as he was at an early age, Morrison had an extra hurdle to tackle after being diagnosed as a type 1 diabetic. Diabetes, of course, complicates any kid's life, but as an athlete, the risks are magnified greatly. Morrison notes he discovered the diagnosis after a three-day camp at Gonzaga. His unregulated blood sugar caused pain and illness so bad that he could barely stand. He knocked down just one shot throughout the whole three-day camp. Throughout his schooling and throughout his career, he managed to combat it. He would make what he calls pit stops on the bench, testing his blood sugar and injecting his stomach with insulin in less than 30 seconds. You can treat the disease to the best of your ability, but it's never going to be easy. The conclusion of his high school career concluded with him putting up 37 points in a game that he was fighting off seizures. He was about as tough as they came. After a very successful high school career, Morrison was ranked as the 26th best small forward in the class. He was left out of Dave Tulloch's top 100 list this year in a move that he calls the worst of his entire career. His recruitment was very dry, but who doesn't love a hometown boy? He accepted one of the few offers that he was given to come off the bench for the Gonzaga Bulldogs, and it wasn't long before he showed why everyone should have offered him. In just 21 minutes per game, Morrison totaled 11.5 off the bench on 53% shooting. Even upperclassmen on his team said that no one wanted to match up with this dude at practice. He improved year after year, upping to 19 a game, being the centric point in the offense. He was your stereotypical slow-footed three. He wasn't a great defender, but he played hard on both ends and had the frame to guards twos through some fours. He could pass a bit, he could handle the ball, and the ball was in his hands during the biggest moments, but where he shined the most was putting the ball in the basket. He was as crafty as they came, using his length to shoot over and around his defender. It was a blast to see. He gained attention across the country, but it was nothing compared to what was to come in the following season. Morrison's junior season was a college basketball phenomenon. He had developed into an undeniable force. He was one of the best scorers at the college level this century. The year was highlighted by a rivalry between the two top scorers in the NCAA, J.J. Redick and Adam Morrison. The year consisted of a back and forth brawl in a war for the NCAA scoring title. This was an oddity with the title rarely ever going to a powerhouse team like Gonzaga and certainly not at Duke. The rivalry brought in new fans to the scene. There wasn't really anything like this ever before. JJ was already established as one of the most hated players in college basketball. His cocky attitude on the most prestigious school in the country made Morrison even more lovable than he already was. I mean, a slow-footed white dude with a crusty mustache and a bowl cut slinging threes like Larry Bird? How could you not love this guy? He looked like he should be installing my HVAC system, but instead he was torturing the best players in the country. Morrison finished the race for the title on top, totaling a whopping 28 points per game. On an even more impressive 50 and 42 shooting split, he was the best in the country. When he got his Larry Bird comparison, it didn't seem too crazy when he got hot because he put up 45 times including a 37 point barrage in the first half against Loyola. He was the best shooter in the NCAA. Morrison ran into March Madness guns a blazing. At the number 3 seed, they were looking for the long awaited trip back to the motherland and they had their guy to do it. They ran through the tournament into the Sweet 16, but not without dramatics at every which way. He carried them through the first game with his late game heroics before matching up against the two-seeded Bruins. They buried them down 15 in the first half and had the game all but won before March Madness Magic reared its ugly head. Three crucial turnovers turned a sure win into a heart-snatching loss. Morrison, who poured everything into his 24-point performance, broke down into tears at center court, which became basically a viral meme before viral memes were a thing. This went down in infamy. It even landed him on an NBA Live commercial. I understand it's a masculine to break down, but hey, the dude cared more than the next guy. I don't understand why you'd mock him from the couch. Uh, this moment became his legacy to a lot of people, unfortunately. It was also his last moment in the NCAA declaring for the draft. 
and the 2006 NBA draft class was, well, underwhelming. Highlighted by Andrea Bargnani, Lamarcus Aldridge, Rudy Gay, and Brandon Roy. It was alright, I guess, but there really wasn't many standouts. Morrison was predicted to go third to the Bobcats in most mock drafts, and third he did go. If there's one thing that the Bobcats are good at, it's, uh, well, nothing. This was one of the sorriest stints in NBA history. Morrison was given quite a bit of opportunity with the Bobcats to start the season and finish the year with an 11 point per game average, which isn't too bad at all. But on the 38% shooting percentage, it made it far less appealing from a coach's perspective. That mixed with his defense, which never really was up to par for an NBA player, the Hornets decided to remove him from the starting lineup partway through the season. It's a gamble in situations like this. It's hard to predict whether lessening the load on a player can ease the pressure to let them adapt more comfortably, or will just strip their confidence altogether. It seems to me that Morrison's biggest problem outside of just the speed of the NBA game was getting his feet set and really getting his confidence. Going to the NBA is a big enough leap as it is, but this was also Morrison's first time leaving his hometown altogether, and I can only imagine that makes it much harder to find your footing. On top of that, it became clear later on that Morrison and his teammates did not exactly get along. Teammate Jared Dudley claimed that Adam Morrison was a pig. Apparently, he never took showers, ripped chewing tobacco, carrying around spit cups, and only wore three shirts throughout the entire year. He referred to Morrison as by far the most disgusting teammate he's ever played with. It got so bad that Gerald Wallace reportedly had to make him take a shower. Imagine that. Imagine forcing a grown man to take a shower. He should be ashamed of himself. I don't think they were too fond of him. At the conclusion of his rookie year, yeah, it wasn't the worst year in the world, but before his second year, his hopes of an NBA career were essentially just taken from him, tearing his ACL in a preseason game. ACL injuries derailed careers, and this was derailed before it even got started. Although Morrison had potentials of spot up, his defensive game was hurt even more by the injury. The combination of never finding his confidence in the NBA and the game's zooming past in post-injury equaled Adam Morrison riding the bench for the rest of his career. After 44 games putting up four a game, inefficiently for the Bobcats, he was dealt to the Lakers where he actually went on to win two championships. Jimmy Kimmel's highlight reel of him shows all the action you need to know from these runs. Without touching the floor in either finals, he failed to land another contract, leaving him without a job, and he never managed to touch an NBA floor again. Like I said before, I don't fully blame Morrison for his failure. He landed in just about the worst position that he could have fallen into. I mean, there's no guidance on a team that's new top to bottom. From what we saw in his rookie year, do I think that there's a world where he could have blossomed into a star? No, I don't. It was clear the NBA game was too fast for him. He couldn't really get to his spots and create for himself, and defensively, he was never going to be up to par. But I absolutely think that there's a world where one of the NCAA's top shooters could have found a spot on an NBA roster in the 2010s, had he just had a better roll of the dice. There was definitely bigger busts in the 2000s, and you can hear about those by clicking here. Thank you if you made it this far, and peace out.